Um, so hi everybody, um, my name is Mark Jordan from Simon & Fraser University uh, in sunny British Columbia. Um, my lightning talk is not on a repository, it's on a tool or utility you could use with a Fedora repository or other kinds of repositories as we'll see. It's called RipRap. Oops. Um, and it is basically a fixity audit auditing service. Um, I developed it uh, as a successor to uh, Islandora 7 uh, tool called uh, Checksum Checker, uh, which was vertically integrated, tightly integrated within the Islandora stack um, and had a few other architectural uh, features that I thought were not a great idea in retrospect. Um, so uh, developed Rip RipRap as the successor to that in the Islandora 8 context and made it an independent service such that it could be run completely on the side uh, on demand and not stress, add an additional stress to the Islandora stack itself uh, in most cases. So it works such that, and it's, on, it's represented, the RipRap service is represented on the right-hand side of the slide. It's it, it works such that it, you schedule uh, periodic uh, queries uh, to a repository to get a list of resources to check during that run. So let's say 100 resources, and these are the resources in this case are typically binary resources. So the, the, the files that you want to um, validate the fixity of over time. Um, on each run, it gets a list of resources. It iterates through that list and ver validates or verifies the fixity uh, checksum um, on each resource, compares the results of that fixity check with um, the last known fixity check that it has done on that resource that's stored in this database. And if they are uh, the same, it's a pass. If they are different, it could be a failure. It could be something else like uh, uh, a change in, uh, a known change in the, in the resource or what have you. Um, and then stores, in turn stores that fixity check event in its database. And so it, it iterates through time over the all resources in a repository in this fashion and um, records the fixity events in a way that they can be used in various uh, other contexts. For example, in the Islandora context, um, Islandora, and I'll demonstrate this briefly at the end of this uh, presentation, uh, Islandora can provide a user interface for an administrative user to peer into RipRap's record of fixity check events for a given resource or at a repository level to see if there are any failures. Uh, and I'll show, how, show you how that works in a few minutes. Some of its more useful features are that it stores a results of fixity checks in a simple structure. I'll go over that in the next slide, I think. Um, there's enough information in this data structure to model your fixity uh, events as premise fixity events, fixity check events, if you wanna do that. Not necessary, but it's all, the, all the information is there if you do want to uh, expose these as premise or serialize them as premise. Um, it uses a modular architecture uh, that uses plugins for all of its major input storage and output functionality. So it, you can use RipRap itself in a variety of ways against a variety of repositories, Fedora, local file system, uh, bare metal, C OCFL, what have you. Thin mode is a, an option where instead of recording every fixity event over years, um, you can record only the most recent one and all of the failures. Um, and this is useful because over time, fixity events can really pile up. You can have millions and millions of fixity events in your uh, database, uh, depending on how often how many objects are in your repository and how often you want to check the fixity. Um, so having a thin mode like this is a way to kind of keep the total number of fixity events in, in RipRap's database to a manageable level without let it, worrying about it getting out of control. If you, if you do want for, you know, your preservation framework mandates that you do want to have a, a record of every fixity check event applied to a resource over time, then you have the option to, uh, to keep those. But you're also going to inherit a pretty large data management uh, task uh, in a few years. And finally, RipRap has a, a REST interface to allow it to interact with third-party applications uh, like Islandora and others. Um, but primarily, RipRap is a command line interface. It runs on a cron job on a, on a server, uh, wakes up, runs, does its thing, goes back to sleep. Next time around, does the same thing uh, in that fashion. The data structure is straightforward. I won't go into these in detail, but basically, you have the, um, 
uh, timestamp, algorithm value, and then some premise specific fields that will record things like um, details and whatnot in case you do that for your premise uh, serializations or any other purpose. Plugins that I mentioned, there are four kinds. Um, fetch resource list basically is a piece of code. The plugin is a piece of code that tells RipRap where to get the next set of resource locations, either URIs, URLs, or, or file system paths to check. Fetch Digest is a plugin that goes and does the fixity check. It actually gets the fixity value for that current resource. Persist is a plugin that stuffs the results of that fixity check in a database or a CSV file or a no, uh, key value store or what have you. And post check plugins are plugins that run after each fixity check is run. And this is useful for things like notifying, sending an email to the administrator saying, hey, you've got, you've got a failure here and things of that nature. So just to move uh, into some examples of how uh, um, I've integrated RipRap with Islandora, um, I'm going to show you two examples. One is at the object level, and the next slide is at the repository level. There are other ways that Islandora integrates with RipRap. Um, but uh, at the object level, uh, we see here a list of all of the files essentially attached to an Islandora object. This is a standard part of Islandora. Um, uh, media is the Drupal term for file basically in, uh, in the Islandora context. What RipRap does is adds that final or rightmost column fixity auditing. And what we see in this uh, view is uh, we have a uh, preservation master file with the name boats and it is a JPEG file and then a couple of derivatives that Islandora has generated for consumption, a service file and a thumbnail version. Uh, in Islandora typically administrators would not would only store the preservation master or original file in Fedora, they would not typically store the thumbnails, for example, in Fedora. In this case, we see here in the fixity auditing column um, a report from RipRap that uh, indicates that everything is cool with this file. It's all green. If there was a problem, it would be either orange or, or red if there was an out, fail, uh, out and out failure uh, recorded in RipRap's database amongst all of the fixity check events for this particular uh, file, this binary resource in Fedora. Um, I'm not going to demo it here, but uh, there's a link here to uh, the, a list of all of the fixity event check events in RipRap's database for this particular resource. You click on that, the administrator will see a, a table listing all the events in case they want to look at those. So that's integration at the object level. And what is happening here is on demand, as the admin user views this list, uh, RipRap, uh, sorry, Islandora goes out and queries RipRap's REST interface and says, hey, I'm, I, want, I want all of your, the events for all of these files. And if there are no events for a file, RipRap returns a zero number of events for that file and Islandora represents that as not in Fedora. If there are events, it shows the information that we have here. At the repository level, um, the Islandora RipRap module um, generates a graph that indicates, uh, it identifies all of the failed fixity check events uh, in its in RipRap's database um, and represents them in this way. Uh, this is actually faked up data to demonstrate that the uh, charting library we use <laughs> is working. It is not an actual real live repository. Um, but it just shows uh, along the bottom axis uh, months and on the vertical axis uh, number of failed fixity check events um, for that month. It doesn't do anything to help you rectify the fixity checks or anything else. You, it is simply a warning, a, a, a global vis visualization of fixity, failed fixity check events in your database, in your perhaps database, and then you as the administrator must go and investigate. Just to speculate about how you could, we could integrate RipRap with Fedora without Islandora, that is to say simply just with, Island, with Fedora or as independently of Islandora if that's desired, um, it would be fairly easy. Uh, right now, the two plugins that the current Islandora toolchain uses, the Fetch Digest plugin and the Persist plugin, they exist, they work, and they could be used in this particular configuration as well. We would not need to rewrite those plugins or write special ones. We would need to write a special plugin just for Fedora, and we would do that by um, uh, uh, 
uh, querying Fedora 6's new simple search API to get all of the binary resources um, and uh, utilize the paging information within that API uh, options to page through over time uh, all of the resources, all the binary resources uh, in the repository or some subset that you're interested in checking fixity on. Um, as that goes on over time, uh, RipRap would accrue a set of fixity check events for these resources. And if you wanted to uh, present um, the user of Fedora's HTML UI with a uh, list of all of those events so they could peruse them or identify uh, uh, problematic events, you could add a link like this one, which is consistent with what we have now in the Fedora HTML UI, uh, UI that would do something similar to what the Islandora example I showed a few minutes ago does. That is to say, you click on it, user clicks on it, it, it goes, queries, rip wraps that REST interface, brings back a list of all of the fixity check events for this particular uh, binary resource in Fedora and presents them to the user in some way. That's just a speculation or a, a whiteboard on my part, um, but it would be fairly easy to realize. And that's my last slide. I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody has on this. Thank you. Hey, Mark, thanks for that presentation. Um, this is Josh. Um, wondering about the queue for what's to be checked. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually implemented a fixity checker as well. Very, it seems very similar in design. Um, and one of the things we found was quite resource intensive was the sorting of all the things that might be checked by yeah. to find which ones had been checked longest ago, I guess, is what we were trying to do. And I'm just wondering how you solved that problem. How, um, how I haven't, you get that cue of what to be checked in any given session of checking? Yeah, that is, um, that is taken care of by, by the uh, fetch resource list plugin that I mentioned. And that is really, uh, RipRap doesn't have an opinion about um, how difficult or easy that is. It just wants a list. Um, so you, to integrate uh, RipRap with an application like Fedora or anything else, you would need, you would need to optimize the, that, the very list of things you're asking about um, independently, of, independently of RipRap. It doesn't, it's, it's, it's agnostic to that. Um, so uh, in fact, prior to Fedora 6's Simple Search API, it would have been, I think, fairly difficult to, uh, to get a list, a paged list of all of the resources in, in the repository. Um, and I'm really happy to see that the Simple Search API uh, appears to have solved that problem, or at least uh, provided tools for making that much, much more straightforward. I haven't actually tried them yet myself, but um, as I was saying uh, during that slide, it would be fairly easy to write a plugin to, uh, to do that. Um, provided that all of the bits that we need within the simple search API in Fedora are there, and I think they are. And all you need is basically is a way to define bi to limit to binaries and a limit to offer paged lists. You don't want to check 3 million, <laughs> um, you don't want to list of 3 million things. Right. Um, uh, so I think a strategy, and this is probably a matter of trial and error, I don't know if there's any, any optimization uh, algorithms for this, but um, getting that sweet spot between the frequency of running RipRap or any other utility and the number of resources you check. And if you can get that sweet spot such that you can check all of everything in your repository of interest over a, a reasonable amount of time, uh, you can do that. I noticed a question about uh, uh, some, uh, concurrent uh, performance checks from Scott. And yeah, you could do that as well. Um, that, that would enable you to meet that goal of checking everything within a year, for example. Uh, more realistically, um, and I don't think it would uh, be problematic. Other than you would you would need to um, synchronize those lists somehow. You don't want to get in the situation where you're checking the same thing out of more often than anything else, unless you think it's on vulnerable storage or whatever the particular policy reason is. Um, but Scott, to move on to your question, um, we haven't tested RipRap in a multi-threaded environment, but you can certainly run, uh, run it uh, concurrently. Um, I think one thing you would need to watch for is uh, um, transactions within the database is one thing. Um, that, it is transaction, it, it is, does use transactions, so that shouldn't be a problem. I guess you'd have to have a well-tuned uh, MySQL or Postgres database to keep up with that. So uh, Doran, I can speak from, uh, the, our experience at Simon Fraser University, 
uh, using Angular 7's, uh, the predecessor to this, uh, and I mean, it's an entirely different tool, uh, but it does the same thing. It checks, checks resources in Fedora on a periodic basis. And then in, in that case, it actually writes the outcome of that event into the Fedora audit log, which is one of the things I didn't want to do <laughs> um, this time around. I wanted the, those, that data to be completely managed completely independently of, of uh, Fedora. If you want, you could persist those back into Fedora. Um, I just have chosen not to do that um, in, in the initial case anyway. Um, and um, we go, uh, it takes, so we have a three, three Fedora repositories, three Fedora repositories. Uh, biggest one is about 900, sorry, 600,000 uh, objects. It's a newspaper repository. Second largest one is about 250,000 newspaper repository. And the third one, which is our general repo, has got about 300,000 missile, like everything you can think of. Um, and we, uh, for the, um, uh, the smallest repository, I think we chew through a cycle once every uh, few months. That's probably, I don't think that's necessary. Uh, I think you could do it a lot more slowly. Um, and what should really define how often you complete a cycle is your preservation policy, right? Like you choose a, choose a period that you think is reasonable given your resources, given the stress on your infrastructure and whatnot, and say, we will check, you know, do a thorough check on everything in our repository every year. And if that's your goal, then you figure out how to configure your, your utility to do that in that given amount of time. Um, that's what I would, say is it don't, there's no ideal and it depends on, you know, how, uh, uh, how uh, uh, confident you are in your storage <laughs> and how much time you want uh, in advance to attempt to fix anything that your utility will find, uh, any problems your utility will find. Um, and if you're fairly certain, fairly comfortable with your storage, you may, it may be a slower, slow period. If you have old crappy storage hardware, <laughs> You may want to do a lot faster. Of course, that's going to put a lot more stress on your storage, <laughs> right? So maybe you don't want to do it more frequently. Not an answer, but I'm just saying I don't really have a good answer to that question. I can add just one thing uh, to Doran's question. Uh, we, we've been running fixity checks uh, in a systematic way for a couple of years, and I can confidently say it's a one in a million occurrence, but it does occur. <laughs> Yep. Um, we've had uh, one incident with a file where a bit seems to have flipped and that it was a TIFF file and it changed. It was still, it was still usable. You could still look at it and you didn't notice any problem, but there was a bit that flipped somewhere. And then we did have a file that disappeared. And we think what happened there was uh, there's a moment in the ingest process of loading something into Fedora when that when those binaries are sitting in temporary storage and at one point they get copied and we think there was some kind of a yeah. momentary glitch or something uh, in that act of copying and that led to that file disappearing. You bring up a really good point, Joshua. I, uh, I, I mean, uh, a lot of people argue that you don't even need this kind of utility anymore because ZFS and other modern file systems, they, they, they do fix the do fix the checking for you. Um, that may be true, I'm not gonna argue with that, but what I think a secondary and very important uh, purpose of this kind of fixity checking utility is not just to ver uh, validate the, the fixity hasn't changed over time, but to validate your file is still what you think it is. Yeah, like that it's basically, it's, it's not so much fixity checking, it's, it's uh, uh, location checking. And that's a, that's a valuable side effect of conventional, in this manner, conventional fixity checking. Yeah, well, thanks, Mark. And uh, we can continue to take questions here. And I know we, we do want to circle back on one uh, for Doran that we didn't get to earlier. Uh, just wanted to note for everyone on the line that the, the sort of formal presentations for the day have concluded. Uh, and this time is now just available for uh, questions or discussion or, or anything like that. And, and I think we can keep the room open for uh, a little bit. But of course, if folks um, need to leave, uh, feel free to, uh, to do so. Um, but I, I think we'll just kind of uh, roll into some discussion here, and, and maybe we can return to that question. I think Scott had a question for Doran earlier, and I'll, I'll just read this for you, Doran. Um, regarding moving your metadata to RDF, uh, how much do you plan to convert to RDF, um, and does that include all of your descriptive metadata, mods, DC, mets, et cetera? 
Right, yeah. Um, to some degree, it's still to be determined. Our, our lead metadata librarian is not on the call here. I, I think I could say generally, we don't use Dublin Core much. Um, METS, we use really as more of a packaging format. And there's some, there's some um, kind of preservation level metadata in there, like uh, technical metadata in there. Although it does, I think, contain, uh, it's also a wrapper around descriptive metadata. Um, we do not use mods, although we do use kind of a custom descriptive metadata scheme for our repository, which I, th I think is to some degree like mods. So I would guess that we would shoot to um, make a c core custom detail specific metadata available in RDF, although it probably would not be uh, strictly mods. Um, I, I don't know if you have any, any thoughts on top of that, Jennifer? I know we haven't really started down that road yet. Yeah, yeah, that's still to be determined. But yeah, the Dublin Core, we just basically make that available for the public to download. Um, so. Okay, yeah, it's just kind of curious. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's just uh, curious because I've had lots of discussions about that and some we've also looked at also. We have quite a few different standards that we're using for descriptive metadata and it seemed like the number of triples that you're dealing with and the complexity of your data can really explode if you start migrating that to RDF. So we had been taking an approach more of um, just kind of keeping uh, minimal things for like really rapid searches or resource index kinds of searches in RDF and then using something like Solar or whatever to, um, as a plugin to search um, our mods and our other more kind of lengthy descriptive metadata. But I'm always curious to see you know, other approaches that people are taking to that same question. Yeah, it's a good point. And so certainly we would want to address performance. We haven't even thought about that. First probably would be functional completeness. Um, I, I seem to recall that, uh, I think Nancy, who is our kind of lead on this, was favoring the Europeana data model for some of this. Uh, although again, we haven't started down that path. So I, I don't know if that gives any guidance. Um, but generally, I think the goal would be to um, certainly put relation, relation style metadata in this um, and, and definitely some descriptive metadata. Well, to me, an uh, un underutilized or underexplored avenue for solving some of these problems is simply to put the, put your, say you have XML, very complex XML, just put your XML into Fedora and have it be indexed or somehow consumed by whatever you need to consume it, but it doesn't have to all be converted into Fedora's native system. I think that's an underappreciated uh, feature of Fedora. It's a pretty cool design feature that you could just simply put those files in there and, and they'd be accessible, you know? Yeah, when we go to Fedora 6, that's definitely going to, be, going to be what we do day one. And then we might do some selective harvesting of some of the XML to turn into RDF, but it would probably be an add-on and the XML would still just be the bit stream that we would consume to um, put into solar. Uh, that's the way we're doing it right now. Yeah, that, that, that's how our, um, our OCR uh, work, works. It's, it's stored as XML, but it gets consumed into, into solar for, to make it a, a fast search. Yeah, that's what we're doing as well. We have a cu our custom metadata scheme is in XML in Fedora 3, and, and I think that migrates over okay to 6, but as you said, as kind of just a XML payload without any smarts, which probably is good for safekeeping, I would agree. And so how much of that to throw in RDF is, is an open question. I mean, we do, we do want to leverage aspects of the linked data platform as much as makes sense at the Fedora layer, which which is a whole nother discussion in and of itself, I think is, you know, where does this thing sit in your stack? If, if it's Fedora more of a backend application or is it really positioned to, in your architecture, positioned to um, handle um, uh, RDF queries and, and publish, publish those things? Um, so yeah, I think probably we will also, uh, at least for safety and then just simplicity, migrate our initial custom descriptive metadata XML over in the same way it is, certainly have it there. And then, and then as a separate task, kind of bolt on, well, 
which of these do we want to pick and choose to migrate to RDF? Uh, I'm assuming it doesn't come over in the migration. You could imagine it'd be pretty cool if that did at some point to have, and I, and I think Mike Durbin headed down this road, how, how provide some kind of mapping from your current metadata to the target and have it do that during migration. I mean, that would be really slick, but you know, I, I'm, I'm sure the plumbing's not there and it would, it would take some effort, I think, to get there. Uh, otherwise, that'll be a separate task to crawl all that after the after the migration and generate RDF. Well, this is James from Texas A&M once more, and I, I can't help but jump in here. Um, so I, we're uh, kind of recent comers to the Fedora space and uh, a bit of a greenfield. Um, we we didn't have um, Fedora three. We we just got to start with Fedora four. And we had a lot of history with uh, DSpace, and so we were quite familiar with uh, Dublin Core style metadata. And we also had um, some mods, XML files actually, that were sitting alongside some of the items that uh, you know DSpace was sort of blissfully uh, unaware of. They were just like additional resources as far as DSpace was concerned. Um, and when we started going to Fedora, we found that we were able to find most of what we were looking for in terms of descriptive metadata in Dublin Core, especially if you go into the DC term space. Um, but there are just so many different schemata sitting out there, so many RDF schemata. I mean, I, I think whatever you're looking for, you can find a standard somewhere that uh, somebody came up with a term for you. So um, I, I think it's, um, it's perilous to um, start minting your own, uh, you know, predicates. That being said, we've certainly done it ourselves a few times. Like we have, um, you know, our, our local details field and that kind of thing. Uh, so it's it's almost irresistible at certain points. But yeah, yeah similar experiences going on. I just wanted to kind of share that because I'll, I'll be talking tomorrow a little bit, but I don't think that's going to come up in the presentation much. Um, just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, thanks, James. That's a that's a great point. And to be clear, I, I don't think I illustrated that in our example. So we do have a custom descriptive metadata sc scheme, but but it's strictly internal only. We don't make it available to the user. It's really to make descriptive meta to present descriptive metadata in a fashion which is more understandable to the end user. And so we would definitely, I think, try to do exactly what you said in terms of if, if we were to put these things out there on the web use use existing standard as much as we can and not mint our own. Which I do, I, I infer that you have a mapping to Dublin Core for public consumption. Yeah, we do have a map to Dublin Core for public consumption. Yeah. It's, I don't think people grab our Dublin Core much, but yeah, we do make it available for that reason, because it's so, so widely you know, understood. Thanks. It's just not very rich. So that's the problem. It's uh, yeah. it, it, it's, it's very coarse, unfortunately. So 